Welcome to Go, or actually Go Go. Get your glasses on Go Go. Brought to you by the Alyosha Society, where we are always pursuing truth and beauty and goodness through great literature. All right, what's this all about? When you read a book, realize it or not, you read that book with a pair of glasses on. Figuratively speaking, the, the lenses represent your worldview, okay? Your presuppositions, your assumptions about life and meaning and purpose and reality. And you read a story through the grid of this worldview perspective. We all do it. You can't avoid it. We filter everything through the lens of that worldview. We understand it, the story that is, and we interpret it from the standpoint of that Worldview, doesn't matter what it is, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, agnostic, atheist, if you say you don't have a worldview, you do, but it doesn't matter. We all have these glasses on. So before I get any deeper here, first, please, please check out the longer video that I did on critical theory, because th this is all going to make a lot more sense, but okay, fine. If you're feeling a bit lazy, then in this video, hang with me. For the Spark Notes version. It's all going to make more sense if you kind of have all that critical theory background, but let's move on. Uh, and I do want you to take note, please take note of this. I am not saying that there's no value to the approaches to literature often referred to as critical theory, whether it's feminist theory, queer theory, uh, critical race theory, you know, CRT, whatever. What I am saying is that we shouldn't discount the value of the biographical and historical context and getting the most out of what we're reading. So, okay, fine. Of course, I am responding to various aspects of the methodology of critical theory. I mean, I, I'm concerned about an approach that says, just let the text speak to you. Whatever you get out of it is valid because there are no invalid ways to interpret literature. Folks, that's just a that's just a fancy pants form of relativism as far as I'm concerned and I'm not I'm not buying it. I do believe that learning more about the author and his or her context, historical, philosophical, all areas it will enrich your reading experience immensely, friends, okay? So in this series, Gago, -go, we're going to be discussing the use of author biographies to better understand what you're reading. Now, in this video, this is the first video, this is my intro, I'm merely introducing Gago. -go. So let, let's do a brief recap of, uh, you know, again, SparkNotes version of what I said in that other video on critical theory. All right, let me pull that up. You know, I feel like I need like some elevator music, you know, just to kind of play while I'm bringing the slides up. Okay, critical theory. Here we go. Uh, get, guys, you know, st strap in, buckle in. I don't plan on spending a ton of detail. Go back and watch the longer video. I really spent a lot of time laying it all out there. So critical theory, what exactly is critical theory? It Critical theory is just a kind of a fancy term that simply refers to whatever glasses, whatever filter, whatever worldview perspective that you have, your assumptions and presuppositions through which you are viewing whatever the book is that you happen to be reading. So I've got to find out where to put myself. Well, let's go over here. So over here on the right-hand side, we have the reader. The reader has to decide. What glasses are you going to use when you're reading this novel, this story? I don't care if it's David Copperfield or Ulysses or Tom Sawyer. doesn't matter. Uh, and you're all going to have a pair of glasses on. Do, do, not, do not try to play this game with me that, you, that somehow or another you're the only person in the history of mankind and womankind who doesn't have a pair of glasses. You all do. We all do. Okay? You can't avoid it. So here we are. There are the glasses. That's critical theory. Critical theory represents what whatever those lenses are. And then, so the reader's on the right, you've got your glasses on, and that's the way you view the text. It's the filter. It's there, okay? And then over there, and, and then between the reader 
and the book, that's that's the worldview lens. So the, the question isn't really, uh, you know, should I have on a, a worldview lens or a pair of glasses? That's not the question. The question is, what what are your glasses? All right, that, that's that's the real question. Okay, so here, here's another way that, that I picture it. Here's the text in the middle here. Whatever this book is you're reading, doesn't matter what it is. You, your critical theory, your worldview lens might be feminist theory. It might be reader response theory. Yeah, and I'm not going to define all these because I told you I did it in the other video. Deconstructivism. You want to go all Freudian or Jungian, whatever the case may be. There's psychoanalytic theory. You see ids and egos and super egos in everything you read. There's African-American theory. New, uh, new historicism structuralism, whoo, got to move myself yet again, lesbian or gay, commonly I think it's just referred to as queer theory, and then finally Marxist theory. So, okay, you're, maybe you're thinking, well, Bruce, my, my glasses are none of these. Uh, no, no, I'm not saying these are the only ones. I'm saying these are probably the most prominent ones, the ones that we usually talk about when we're talking about critical theory, all right? So there it is. What I did in that video, and I'm giving you a very, very, very brief recap here, is I'm, I, I, I lay out critical theory and then I kind of analyze it a little bit. So a summary of that. Critical theory assumes the validity of those worldview lenses. Of course it does. But the, the problem is, I, well, I won't, I won't comment anymore. It, it assumes uh, Marxist theory assumes that Marxism is good and correct and right, okay? Same with all of those other areas. That's something you have to think through. Is it? Is it? Critical theory assumes that the worldviews popular now are the most important and should be used to view all literature. Yeah, see, the problem is 50 years from now, I don't think my little circle that I, in the previous slide, it probably won't look the same. Because there will be other areas of critical theory that'll be more hip and more in vogue. So what are we supposed to do with that? Is there no sort of absolute standard here that kind of transcends time and space and language and, and tribe and so forth? So it, it, it kind of leaves me with, well, whatever's cool and hip during that era with that generation, then those are the areas of critical theory that rule. Critical theories built upon worldviews that are themselves in flux. Okay, so even within, say, psychoanalytic theory, when I when I mentioned Freud and Jung, they don't agree. So if I'm doing psychoanalytic theory, then which one do I go with, and and how do I deal with that? That's another another little speed bump. And then you know I don't I I've, I've read books on critical theory. I don't ever see uh, usually a chapter on you know, Christian theory or Christian worldview theory. Now, again, so, you know, if, if if supposedly all of these worldviews are valid and there's no invalid way to interpret what you're reading, then why would that be the case? Just asking some questions, trying to start, trying to start some conversations here. And so what I concluded is this. Now, when I'm teaching uh, critical theory to my students, I always want to start with don't, don't go in hostile, okay? Look at it and ask yourself, okay, first of all, what's beneficial about this? What's good about it? Before, before we kind of start ripping it apart. Well, I think there are some benefits. Knowing the various lenses can open our minds to see issues that we might have closed down otherwise. Now, I'm not going to name any, but you go back to that circle and you find the worldview perspective that, let's say, you're most opposed to or it's farthest maybe from where you are and some of your values, doing critical theory at least opens your mind to see things in literature that might actually be there. And you're not, you, you, it's not something you would have seen. Okay. It's just something to think about. Knowing the various lenses will help us have a meaningful dialogue with those who are outside the Christian faith. So 
you know, if, I don't, I think we shut down that dialogue when we just kind of write the whole thing off, you know, and we just say, well, Marxism is evil, so I'm not going to debate you about it. Or CRT is evil, so I'm not going to debate you about it. Not helpful. Not helpful. So what are the pitfalls, in my opinion? Well, go back to those four problems I just shared, so I won't reiterate those. Don't elevate the lens to the status of infallibility. See, that, that's problematic for me. If that filter you have, if you are viewing that filter as absolutely and completely infallible, then um, that's problematic. That's problematic. The only, the only infallible truth is the word of God. So the only infallible perspective is the biblical one. So what do I do? Okay. And what am I going to be pushing in this series? I'm trying to lay it right out on the table for you. I use what's called the historical biographical approach. The historical biographical approach to interpret. What does that mean? What it means exactly what it says. I look at historical background context. We read biographies of the authors and we try to learn more about the author. And then we try to then glean or draw out of the text the rich uh, truths and applications and, and beauty and truth and goodness that are all in there. We don't just make it up. We don't go by how we happen to feel that day. Um, so we start with what is genre? Okay, so the genre is going to dictate how I interpret a piece of literature. Poetry, historical fiction, uh, is it an autobiography? Well, whatever, whatever the, you know, is it a Bildungsroman? Who wrote it? When, when did that person live? And what do I know about his or her life? You know, guys, the ones I'm going to be sharing with you, every single one of them, their novels are just kind of infused with the 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 character and the life experiences and family struggles and triumphs of the author. And it's important. You know, we do a little research. I think we'll get more out of it. Who now? This is another one that's interesting to me. When I when I teach certain authors, if we're really digging deep, we'll ask the question. Well, who were the favorite writers and thinkers of that author? You know, Jane Austen was an avid reader. Okay, what books was she reading? You know, same with Dostoevsky, same with Flannery O'Connor. I want to know, you know, because that's going to give you some insight as to what, you know, was going on up here when they were crafting this story. What do we know about the cultural and historical context? I, I, I mentioned that already. That's a part of the historical biographical approach. And, you know, asking if, if there was a specific audience that this author was targeting, then I may not be today living in the 21st century. I may not be a part of that particular audience, but knowing, you know, as much as I can about that audience is going to, I think it's going to give me some insight into better understanding what's going on in the story. So there you have that. Let's wrap this one up. And I, I am going to tell you this, and I'm trying to I'm trying to do it here. This will probably be the longest one in the series. I, I am trying to keep these videos kind of more short and sweet. So, okay. So now that you know where I stand, I want to offer some suggestions as to which biographies would be good ones. I'm gonna, not going to say that these are the best. I'm just going to be sharing with you. These are the ones I've read. And they were good and they were helpful. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to share that with you, some, autobi uh, some autobiographies too. And so I'm going to cover at least the following. Flannery O'Connor, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Mary Shelley, Jane Austen, James Joyce, and Virginia Woolf. Just for fun, I might do a separate video on good biographies of the president's just to have a little bit of fun with it. I kind of went through this weird phase several years ago where I set out to read at least one biography of every president of the United States. And uh, I got a, I got a little ways through, but I, I, I didn't make it, okay? But I, I read some really good books and I may share those with you. So, all right, now that you know what Gago is, Gago, and check out that video on Critical Theory. Uh, that was such a dad move.
Yeah, I'm not even, I'll probably edit that out. So in the next, vi the next video, we're going to be talking about good biographies on Flannery O'Connor. If you have any comments or questions on what I'm sharing here, please, I'd love to hear from you. Bruce at aliosha